No one naturally likes to be corrected. You think about correction, whether it comes from a parent or an employer or perhaps even a friend. No one likes to be corrected. The word instruction in Proverbs chapter 1 is the Hebrew word musar. It means properly, it means chastisement. Figuratively, it means reproof, warning, instruction, or chastening. And so when we think about the wisdom that God has for us, many times it comes through this way. It comes uh, by reproof. It comes by warning. It comes by uh, instruction or chastening. Uh, the instruction of Proverbs, and we read it here four times in our passage there in chapter 1, verses 1 to 8. Uh, four different times the instruction of Proverbs is referring to chastening from God, verse 2 and 3 and verse 7 and 8. And so as I start the message this morning, so many times I like to ask a question at the beginning, or I like you to ask yourself the question, and I want you to ask yourself these two questions. Am I willing to hear instruction? And particularly, we're talking about from God. When God gives you instruction, or when God gives you correction, am I willing to hear instruction? And then a second question that closely follows that, am I willing to receive instruction? It's one thing to hear it, it's another thing to receive it. I, I prayed at the beginning of the service today, I prayed that we would be ready hearers, that we'd be ready to hear, that we would not be distracted, that we would be listening, that we would try to hear what it is that God has for us through his word, but then not just hearers, but the book of James talks about being doers of the word, that we would hear it and then we would apply it to our lives, that we would do it. And so am I willing to hear instruction? Am I willing to receive instruction? So this morning we want to look at the blessings and the benefits of receiving instruction. And then we also want to look at the pitfalls and the problems of rejecting instruction. The book of Proverbs is full of dichotomies. Solomon gives both sides. Here's if you do this and here's if you don't do this. And so as we look at wisdom and committing to wisdom, specifically today, hearing instruction and doing the instruction that God gives us, uh, the, the blessings and the benefits if we hear it, and the problems and the pitfalls if we ignore it. It, it. None of us will be unchanged. We will either respond positively and it will affect good in our life, or we will respond negatively and it will have bad effects in our life. And so uh, let's look this morning at the instruction of correction. The first thing is understanding instruction. It says, The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, and so that we would understand instruction. Uh, when you're trying to show someone something or demonstrate something to someone, if it's as simple as, as cleaning or emptying a trash can or uh, doing some task, you have to show someone how to do it, especially if they've never done that before. Say, so, okay, well, this is what you need to do. It may be this is step one, step two, step three. And you're not trying to treat them as a child. You're not trying to treat them that they don't have any understanding. You're just saying, this is, this is how it works, and I want you to know the, the best way to do this. A lot of times, uh, employers will have an employee uh, give training to someone new. Say, show them uh, what you do. Show them why we do it. Show them how we do it. And so that we would understand instruction. Understanding involves discretion and discernment as we talk about life and the wisdom of God, and uh, we receive it through reading God's Word, we receive it through hearing God's Word taught or hearing God's Word preached. Sometimes it's the instruction, uh, it's a principle from God's Word, but it's given by a parent or by a grandparent. And then that we would have understanding, that we would be able to put that into practice in our life. Well, how? Well, it's going to involve, involve discretion and discernment. It's learning to perceive what is right. He said, perceive the words of understanding. And uh, when you're young, uh, there's not as many things that you've experienced, not as many things that, that you've done. And so as, as your parents or grandparent uh, tell you something and teach you something, you have to perceive it. You have to understand it. Even as we get older, though, there are things in our life that we say, I, I want to I have the right perception I want to have the right understanding that I'm doing this the, the right way. Perception involves discretion. 
between what is right and what I want to do. Sometimes it's very difficult for us to separate, this is what I want to do, but this is what's right. And, and we have to be able to weigh that in our mind. Is this really something that is right, or is this just something that I really want to do? I'll, I'll hear people sometimes say, well, I, I think this is just God's will for my wife. And, and I'm not being a smart aleck, but I'm, I, I want you to consider, is this really God's will for your life, or is it really your will for your life? Is this really what God wants you to do, or is this really, this is just what I want to do, and I'm assigning God's name to it, because after all, that makes it sound a lot better that I say, this. I think God wants me to do this, when in truth, it might just be, I really want to do this. And so that we would have discretion, that we would be able to perceive, uh, is this my will or God's will? Perception, discerning between what is good and what is best. Sometimes we miss out on what is best because we accept what is good. Now, that, that takes a lot of perception, doesn't it? It takes a lot of discretion because we say they're both good options. This is good and this is good, but we should all desire, I want God's best for my life. I don't want to settle for anything less than what God, than what is God's will and what God says is best for my life. And so say, God, would you help me to have understanding that when you instruct that I would have enough perception to listen to what you say through the preaching, teaching, reading of God's word, the instruction of a parent or grandparent, that I could have enough perception to be able to determine what's going to be good and what's going to be best. Because I want what is best in my life. Then we see this instruction comes through discipline, chastening, and correction. And you know, it's interesting in this chapter here, the first chapter, this introductory chapter to the book of wisdom, to the book of Proverbs, that instruction uh, can apply to individuals. It can apply to churches or groups. It can apply to a nation. That if a nation does not choose what is right, there are going to be problems and pitfalls. And so uh, that we would uh, go after what God has for us. The Bible describes the one who understands instruction. Here's the Bible word as a wise person. When you understand instruction, God says that is wise. And when you reject instruction, God says that is foolish. Now, that's strong language because if that was Brandon up here saying that, you might initially or, or immediately get offended. Well, who does he think he is? How does he, how's he going to tell me? But it's not me telling you. That's God saying that. God saying, if you don't listen to the instruction of this book, that is foolish. But if you listen to the instruction of this book and you let it correct you and you let it instruct you, God says that is wise. I believe that every person here this morning would say, I want to be counted wise. I want God to think that the, the actions of my life are wise. I don't want God to think the actions of my life are foolish. Uh, we must understand that being in the Word or neglecting the Word has an impact on your life. And I'm going to give a few specific examples. Uh, we literally could have hundreds, if not thousands, from the Bible. You say, I'm glad you're not giving them all to us, Pastor because we'd still be here at 6 o'clock tonight. So I'm just going to give you a few specific examples, okay? Uh, we all know that a principle that we teach at the church is that you ought to be daily in the Word, right? That's instruction you've heard. You've got that instruction from Sunday school teachers. You've got that instruction from junior church teachers. You've got that instruction from a youth pastor, from a pastor, from Pastor Emeritus, maybe from your mom or your dad or your grandma or your grandpa. We could go on and on and on. You've heard that instruction many times, now, here's what, here is wisdom. Wisdom is saying, if I follow that instruction, there's blessings and benefits, and if I ignore that instruction, there are problems and there are pitfalls. And so that's why we say every person in here ought to be daily in the Word. Because the Bible is very clear that if you're in the Bible, if you're reading God's Word, it is going to have a positive impact on your life. And if you're not in the Bible, it's going to have a negative impact in your life. It is going to influence you one way or the other. Uh, Psalm 1, verses 1 and 2 says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor setteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. 
And very much like Proverbs, uh, Psalms there gives a very clear picture, black and white. Here's if you do it, here's if you don't do it. And they are diametrically opposed. Uh, there, there are blessings and benefits for obeying, and there's problems and pitfalls for disobeying. We must understand that music, uh, Christian music or worldly music, has an impact on your life. There's a principle that we've given instruction on in preaching and in teaching. No doubt you've heard this before, that as Christians, we are to be spirit-led and spirit-filled. Talking about the Holy Spirit of God. That we want the Holy Spirit to fill our life, and we want the Holy Spirit to lead our life. When we make a decision, we don't want it to be a decision of what I want. I want this to be a decision that I'm being led by the Spirit of God. If we're going to do something as a family, it's not about what I want to do, but it's, it, but it's that we are confident that the Holy Spirit is leading our family to do this, that we are uh, filled with the Holy Spirit and we are led by the Holy Spirit. Now, I, I'm saying that in relation to music. And we listen to music, uh, and we're just, we'll just make it two very broad categories, Christian music or worldly music. We won't name all the different genres. There's just music that's Christian or there's music that's secular. Okay? If you listen to Christian music, it is going to help your spirit. It is going to help uh, your worship of God. It is going to put you in the right spirit to live for him and the right spirit to make decisions for him. If you live secular music, that is not going to help you uh, to worship God. It is not going to help you to obey God. It's not going to help you to be filled with the spirit of God. Right? So here's some understanding, understanding that, that music is powerful. All of us would agree on that. All of us understand that music is powerful in our life. Certain kinds of music have certain kind of effects upon us, whether it's suspenseful music or romantic music or uh, athletic event type music that pumps up the crowd. Right? Music is powerful. Well, music in our individual life, it will either help us in our walk with God or it will hinder us in our walk with God. You cannot listen to secular music and, and be completely filled with the Spirit of God because you're filling yourself with all kinds of things that are not the Spirit of God. To be filled with the Spirit, you've got to empty of self and empty of your desires and empty of your flesh and then empty, say, okay, God, fill me with your Spirit. And when we're filled up with the world and we're filled up with the influence of, of the secular uh, realm, there's not much room left for the Spirit to get into our life. And so wisdom says, God, help me in the things that I would listen to. Ephesians 5.19, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. How about this one? Philippians 4.8, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, what sort of things are honest? What sort of things are just? What sort of things are pure? What sort of things are lovely? What sort of things are of good report? If there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. When you are listening to secular music, it's going to be hard to obey Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, about thinking on things that are true and honest and just and pure and lovely and a good report. And so say, God, help me to listen to the right kind of music. Uh, music will change the tone of your home, the right kind of music. The right kind of music will set the tone or it will change the tone for your home. Uh, I, I mentioned this several times uh, because I, I like it so much. I like uh, Sunday mornings. Viola almost always has uh, music, Christian music playing in our house. You know what that does on a Sunday morning? It helps us to be ready for church. We're listening to songs that are about God. We're listening to songs that are about heaven. We're listening to songs about uh, living for God. And as we're hearing those lyrics and we're listening to those songs, uh, before we ever even get to church, we've already met with the Lord. And that doesn't have to be reserved for Sunday. That can be all the time. When you're, uh, when you're cleaning the house or when you're doing a project in the garage or when you're driving to work and you're commuting and it doesn't always have to be music, I think sometimes it's good to not have any noise. I think that's really good. It's, it's very foreign to us today, right? We live in, in a culture and a time when if it's, if it's too quiet at a hotel, Viola will say, uh, we should have brought a fan with us. 
because it's so quiet, right? We're not used to quiet. We're used to there always being noise. But there's something special about things getting quiet and, and, and allowing God to speak to you where you can hear him and not be distracted by all the noise. I understand that there's a time and a place, but if you're going to listen to music, uh, Christian music will have a, a great effect in your life. You must understand that abstaining from alcohol or drinking alcohol has an impact on your life. You've heard us preach it many times. You've heard the instruction at Good Shepherd Baptist Church in Sunday school classes or adult Bible classes or small groups or preaching services. You've heard the stand that we take very clearly. Uh, you are to abstain from alcohol, and it will have an impact in your life. If you receive that instruction and you say, I'm not going to look at it, that's what the Bible says in Proverbs, don't even look at it. Right. I'm not going to look at it. I'm not going to go those places. I'm not going to be around it. I'm not going to drink it. I'm going to avoid alcohol. Or if you reject that instruction and you ignore that instruction and you say, nobody's telling me how I can live my personal life. If I want to have a drink, I'll have a drink. And you can do that but it's going to have an effect in your life and it's going to have an effect in your home and that's a negative effect not a positive effect i, I challenge you i don't believe there's one good thing that somebody could say uh, that that alcohol does for a society but we could tell you thousands upon thousands of examples of what bad can come from drinking alcohol and so that we would uh, and listen to that instruction, that we would understand that instruction. Now, we could go on and on. I could keep giving you more and more specifics, uh, but we're just going to limit it to three this morning. But uh, specifics of receiving instruction, hearing it and then receiving it, uh, to have understanding. Number two, uh, receiving instruction. Receiving instruction. What does that mean, to receive instruction? Well, it's the action of taking what is given. And, and I've went through several times where that instruction can come from. But as that instruction is given, that you say, I'm, I'm ready to take it. I'm ready to receive it. You know what that tells us? It tells us that the Christian life takes effort on our part. God has made it as such that when we become Christians, everything doesn't just magically become what it ought to be. No, you have to make choices. There are things that you have to say yes to, and there are things that you have to say no to. And that's a process for a lifetime. For a lifetime, you say, I'm, I'm learning to say no to so, some things. And maybe as you grow in your Christian life, you say, I, I have to learn to say no to that. I didn't have to before, but now I, I believe I need to say no to that. And then you begin to say yes to things. Some of them are coming to church faithfully. You say, we want to we establish that habit. Not just, we don't want to just come to church sometimes, but we want to become faithful in our church attendance. Uh, we don't want to just read the Bible once in a while, but we want to be faithful. I want to try to start making it a habit that I'm going to be daily, every day, in God's Word. Uh, some of you may make a decision, I'm going to say yes to tithing and giving. And you hear the church uh, preach about giving and tithing and obeying the Lord and giving him the first fruits, giving him the tithe or the tenth. And you say, I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to do that and by faith. And, and there's bills and there's expenses and there's things that have to be paid. And, and I don't understand all of it and I don't know how, but I'm just going to trust that, uh, that the Bible says that's what I'm supposed to do. And if I do it, God's going to take care of me. And I believe there are many that could say amen to the fact this morning that we'd rather have 90% with God's blessing than 100% without God's blessing. And there are many that say, I've, I've done it. I've made, the te I've made the step and I've trusted the Lord. And here's what I found to be true. You cannot outgive God. You give and he's going to give back to you. And those testimonies and those amens are an encouragement to somebody else that I'm going to receive that instruction takes effort on our part. God doesn't just do everything for us. We have choices that we have to make. This word instruction, many times in the Proverbs, it's in the context as you read all the verses. Uh, I think there's 30 different times that it uses this word. It's translated instruction in our King James Bible. And, and when you look up those 30 verses, uh, you'll find that many of them are in relation to parents instructing children. Well, in the New Testament, uh, Jesus said to his disciples, when we pray, we're to pray after this manner, our Father, which art in heaven. And our Father is God, and he gives instruction to his children. 
That's to us. And so as we're reading about uh, earthly moms and dads instructing their children, we can understand spiritually our father gives instruction to us. It says in Proverbs 8 and verse 33, hear instruction and be wise and refuse it not. Well, that could be our prayer. Every time we open the Bible, God help me to hear instruction and to be wise and refuse it not. In other words, God, if you speak to me, I want to hear it and I don't want to fight against it. I don't want to refuse it. If this is what is right and this is what I ought to do in my life, that God, I want to hear it and then I want to do it. That we would have that attitude when we come to a preaching service, that we would say, God, I want you to speak to my heart today. I want you to, I want to hear instruction today. I want to be wise today. I want to refuse it not today. You know why I'm saying that? Because there are times when I'm sitting out there and I'm listening to a preacher and in our flesh, as we're hearing the instruction, we're not receiving it, we're fighting against it. We're, we're giving God all the reasons why, well, this doesn't really apply in my situation. Well, this doesn't really affect me personally. This is probably for that guy over there, or it's probably for the person behind me. But in my situation, and we're, we're given all the reasons. No, we ought to come to the Word of God, hearing instruction, being wise, refusing it not. God, if you show it to me, I want to do it. And so that we would hear instruction and then it's the act of allowing correction to change you that's what instruction has to do instruction after we hear it and after we receive it we've got to be willing to change we've got to be willing to say okay i i get it god what i was doing was not right and i need to change i need to allow you to correct me god works in our life in a manner to bring about change in our life proverbs 6 23 says for the command for the commandment is a lamp and the law is light, and reproofs of instruction are the way of life. This is, this is the message for a lifetime. For a lifetime, God says, as we're going through life, God says, I love you so much that I'm going to correct you to keep you on the right path. This is the way of life. And so that we would say, okay, God, I'm ready to hear your instruction I'm, I'm, I want to be wise. I don't want to refuse it. And so, God, if I'm going this way and you think I ought to be going this way, I, I want to change because I want to go your way. And we ought to come to church and we ought to come to the Bible with the attitude that I'm willing to change if I need to change. If there's something in my life that's not right, God, would you help make it right? God, if there's something that I've not been doing that I ought to be doing, God, would you help me to uh, have the faith to make that change that I can get it right? You know, I believe the older we get, the harder that is to do. You know, young people, I sometimes preach to the kids, maybe at a junior camp or at a vacation Bible school, and, and the kids are, are very receptive that when they hear what's right, they say, I need to do that. And as teenagers, it gets a little harder, and as adults, it gets harder yet. Why? Because the older we get, the more set we get in our ways. The more convinced we get about our philosophies and our beliefs. And so when we come to church, we're already set in our ways. And when God's trying to change us, it's going to take a lot of work for us to change from saying, okay, I was doing it this way, and I'm going to start doing it this way. But that's what God wants to do in your life. It is the way of life. God is not trying to harm you. God is trying to help you. And when God gives instruction, it's not to offend you. It's to correct you. And it's not to destroy you. It's to make you better. And say, I'm going to hear instruction, and I'm going to be wise, and I want to refuse it not. Correction can be difficult. I can say that by the voice of experience. Right? It's not fun to be corrected. That's why I began the message by saying that no one naturally likes to be corrected. I've never met someone that likes to be corrected. It's not, it's not natural for us. Correction can be difficult. Correction sometimes can even be painful. But correction is often necessary. It is necessary for God to correct us that we don't keep going and don't keep doing the same thing. Say, God, would you correct me? Even if it hurts some, would you change me? 
even if it's difficult, if it's the hardest thing I feel like I've ever done, God, would you help me to change to be what you want me to be because I want to be in the way of life? John 15, 2, Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Well, that is a tough verse of Scripture there. What God's saying is that God has to do some cutting sometimes. On a tree, he's given a tree that a tree has to be pruned and some branches have to be cut off. And you say, well, that's that's not too painful. That's not too difficult. What's so hard about that? We're the tree. And sometimes God's going to have to cut some things off. And I don't know about you, but usually things that are in my life, I like them in my life. I've put them in my life. And when you have to have those cut off and you have to have those taken away, that can be very difficult and it can be very painful. But when you prune a tree, what you're doing is you're saying, if I don't do this, this tree eventually it's going to die. And, and a Christian, when God is doing his pruning, it is not to hurt you, it is to help you. And it is to help you to be what you want to be. And sometimes we've got to be open enough to say that when I come to church, God, if there's something in here that shouldn't be in here, would you cut it off? Would you get it out of my life, even if it means a little bit of pain that I can become what you want me to be? And then rejecting instruction. Rejecting instruction. Very simply, it's the act of refusing what is given. God uses strong language to describe those that refuse instruction. We, we hardly ever call someone a fool, right? When you use that word to say someone is a fool or to say someone is foolish, well, you're, you're, you're describing something in a very uh, 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 heavy way, right? This is something that, 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 is, that is the worst of the worst, I can't believe they did that. I can't believe they would say that. It's a strong uh, word in our vocabulary. But God uses that word to describe those that refuse instruction. Proverbs 10, 17, let me give you a couple of them. He is in the way of life that keepeth instruction, but he that refuseth reproof erreth. God says you are wrong to refuse instruction. Proverbs 15, 32, he that refuseth instruction despiseth his own soul, but he that heareth reproof getteth understanding. Will you reject instruction? And we can reject instruction sitting in a church service. We can reject instruction while our parents are talking to us. You can reject instruction while God's talking to you. Sometimes you can be driving down the road, God the Holy Spirit speaking to our heart. And right there in that moment, we're going to have one of two options. We can yield and obey what the Holy Spirit's speaking to us about, or we can refuse and reject what the Holy Spirit... The the Bible uses that word, and I believe it's in Ephesians, where it says, quench not. We quench what it is that the Holy Spirit's trying to do in our life. It's like we're shutting Him up. We don't want to listen to Him. We don't want to think about that. Will you reject instruction? The act of resisting change from correction. Well, some of us, we just don't want to change. We just resist the change that God's trying to bring about in our life. Man, res- resist God's instruction. And, and kind of figuratively, if you will, we raise our fist to God. I'm not going to change that. Now, you may not literally do that. But in your heart, that's what you're doing. You ever seen a little kid, sometimes little kids will get that demonstrative. Usually gets them in a lot of trouble. But they'll look to mom and dad and they'll be like, and, and they'll growl or they'll make noises. And usually right away, boy, that's, that's going to get you in a lot of trouble. You know, we do the same thing with God. God tries to speak to our heart. And in our heart, what we're doing is, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to change. I'm not going to correct that. And we are resisting the instruction that God wants to bring in our life. In spite of God's chastening hand, nations can do the same. We think of things that even an insurance agent will say it was an act of God. An act of God. You know, God uh, God rebukes nations. God chastens nations. And just like God chastens an individual and and an individual can raise their, a, a country can raise their fist to God. We're not changing that. Well, we see it in our country with abortion 
literally millions of babies murdered because in the name of a woman's choice. We're very clear, the Bible is very clear when conception or when birth begins at conception, when a human life, God's the giver of life. God gives life, God can take life, but we've redefined that and we've declared that we can take life. We can take life up to almost the very end. It's, it's sickening to, to read and to listen and to see some of the videos that are associated with abortion. We see it in homosexuality and same-sex marriage and transgender and and you hear of these children that have mutilated their bodies, had surgeries to mutilate their body, to, to change their body from a boy to a girl or a girl to a boy. Sometimes they've been able to do that even without mom and dad consenting to it. You say, how can that happen? How can that take place in the country in which we live? You know what that is? That is a nation raising their fist to God. For thousands of years, the Bible has declared exactly what it declares today. It has not changed. The Word of God will not change. And the Bible has always said, for man to lie with man uh, like he lies with a woman, it's abomination. It's an abomination for homosexuality, whether it's two men or whether it's two women. It is an abomination to God. And Christians have not changed. The Bible has not changed. And you know what it is? It's a society raising their fist to God saying, we don't care what the Bible says. We don't care what God says. They're resisting and they're rejecting that instruction. Jeremiah chapter 2 verse 30 says, In vain have I smitten your children. They received no correction. Your own sword hath devoured your prophets like a destroying lion. Jeremiah 7 and verse 28, But thou shalt say unto them, This is a nation that obeyeth not the voice of the Lord their God, nor receiveth correction. Truth is perished and is cut off from their mouth. Now that was not talking about the United States of America, but it certainly sounds like it could apply to the United States of America. A nation that obeyeth not the voice of the Lord their God, nor receiveth correction. Truth is perished and is cut off from their mouth. Instruction, remember we said that instruction several times today, it's, it's rebuke, it's reproof, it's correction. That may not be our first choice, but it may very well be our best option. Say, God, would you instruct me? God, would you correct me? Wisdom uses perception and discernment to understand instruction, saying, God, would you help me to understand what's best for me? Would you help me to perceive what's going to be uh, obedient to you? What's, what's going to discern to be the way of life? Then wisdom receives the correction that God is trying to effect in your life. Many times correction is necessary to bring about real, lasting change. If you have your Bibles open, you can turn to Proverbs chapter 24. And I'll finish here if you're still open there in Proverbs 24. I want you to notice these verses, verse 30 down to verse 32. I went by the field of the slothful and by the vineyard of the man void of understanding. And lo, it was all grown over with thorns and nettles had covered the face thereof. And the stone wall thereof was broken down. Then I saw and considered it well. I looked upon it and received instruction. You know, God has given us a, a brain. God has given us some common sense that we can observe things in life that help us to perceive wisdom. He went by and he saw this, uh, this land, this field of the slothful. He said, I can learn some things from that. Uh, how, how the nettles have grown over and the thorns have grown over and the, the walls have broken down. I want to receive instruction. And, and not just that my wall and my field's not like that place, but the idea spiritually is that my life is not like that. That my life's not broken down and my life's not grown over with sin. And my life's not tangled up with the thorns and the problems of sin in my life know that I would receive instruction. That every time we would come to church, every time we would read the Bible, that we'd say, God, would you help me to hear instruction? Would you help me to be wise and help me to refuse it not? Let's go ahead and stand this morning, if you would. I ask you to bow your head, close your eyes just for a moment. We're going to have our 
pianist to come. She's going to play through a verse of invitation.